come on, come on, come on. Anybody love Jesus in this place? Hey, you can be seated. Thank you so much. It is uh, such an honor to be with you. Thank you, Pastor Amy, Pastor Stacy, for having me. Uh, I am, uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ryan. I'm on the uh, Covenant teaching team. I get to go around to the different campuses, and it gets offered to all of the campus pastors, and McKinney always picks me first. So I want you to know, y'all are my favorite campus. Okay, don't tell Crossroads or Colleyville what I said, okay, although they can watch this message online. I love you, G, and Pastor Ricky from the bottom of my heart. Uh, it's been a minute since I've been here. Uh, the last time I spoke to you, I only had one child. Now I have two. Here is a picture of, um, of the family. So we just had this one, obviously. Um, this one, we asked him what we should name this one. He said, Spider-Man Leak. We can't do that because we're responsible parents. So we went with Roman Xander Leak, and uh, he is, uh, he's three months old and uh, the absolute joy of our life. And uh, that, that's, uh, that's me and, and the happy family. Hope, we'll, hope you're well today. Uh, if you're here today, um, you're not a church person, uh, maybe a friend of yours tricks you into coming here. They say, hey, let's go get some coffee. And they brought you into that lobby and say, oh, what are these people doing in here? And all of a sudden you're here. I want you to know that um, our paths are not crossing on accident. And I believe that today is going to be helpful to you uh, regardless of where you are on your spiritual journey. Um, I want to look at some words of Jesus um, that I believe if applied, um, it, it's, a, it's a verse, um, if you are a church person, that you've probably heard a, a million times. But if this is a verse, if applied, has absolute ramifications that will absolutely change your life. Uh, it says this um, in Matthew 5, uh, starting in verse 43. It says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy." Which is very logical, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Like, if you have an enemy, the most logical thing to do is to hate them. And if you have a neighbor, somebody that's like you, it's like, yeah, I'm going to like the person that's like me. That makes complete sense. Here's what Jesus says next. He says, but I say to you, like, I know that there is this way of living that makes complete sense to you, but I got a new way for you to live. And, and this is what I say to you. It says, love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Today, I want to speak to you on the subject of welcome to the otherhood. Look at your name on the right and say, welcome to the otherhood. Look at your other neighbor and say, are you getting me brunch after this? I hope you sit next to a generous, a generous neighbor. Come on, will you pray with me for a moment? Father, I thank you so much for each and every person watching this message. God, I pray that today you would help us love like you love. Help us to extend what you have extended to us, to those around us. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody say it. Um, I believe that God made two types of people, Walmart people and Target people, okay? How many of you are Walmart people? Okay, all of the savers in the room, we're in a small group together. We're going to meet after service, okay? Um, how many of you are Target people, Target people? Look at all of the rich people. This is awesome. I'm so glad you came to service today. Um, I grew up a Walmart person. I I I'm a saver. I'm always looking for a way to save money, looking for a deal. Um, I hadn't spent that much time in Target until I got married, and then all of a sudden it was like, I married a Target person. I said, we, 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 don't, we don't have the same values in life. Um, when my wife goes to Target, I get a little panic attack every time. Um, because Target is, is designed for you to spend as much money as is in your bank account. So you can go there intending to get milk, and you might leave with a couch or a kitchen table. Like, that's how it works. Okay? Like, that's what they're trying to do. Okay? So... I could be watching the Super Bowl, and my wife would be like, hey, I'm going to run to Target. I'm like, no, you're not. Whoa, 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 what's happening right now? Okay, I got to pause the TV and go, what, what exactly are we getting that we can't get on Amazon? Okay, like, like can we please just hold the presses? Uh, um, there's another type of people. Um, there are uh, Coke people, Pepsi people, and Dr. Pepper people. Um, how many of you are Coke people? How many of you are Pepsi? How many of you are Dr. Pepper? 
How many of you are healthy water people and you're mad that anybody is even, you're just judging the rest of us? Like this, this unhealthy person is on the stage. He doesn't deserve the microphone. Um, there are many things that, uh, many labels, if you will, that can separate us. We learn it in middle school early on, jocks and cheerleaders, the popular, the unpopular, uh, sort of things that can divide us. Uh, for the rest of our time today, I'm going to use this phrase, the otherhood. And when I say the otherhood, I'm talking about somebody that's other than you, and not just different than you, but somebody that's almost in uh, opposition to you. It's difficult for us to look at anybody else in the room and call them an enemy, but uh, it is uh, possible that there is somebody else in this room that we might wish ill will towards. Like that there's something in us that's going, I don't know about this person. And, and I think our otherhood has levels. I think on the surface level, it's it's people we just don't gel well with. You know, like the chemistry mix isn't there. Uh, they got a different Enneagram number than us. Uh, they, they, they got a diff. they're an introvert, you're an extrovert. They're, they're like, they're, there's just, there's just something not right. Like how many of you have somebody like that you don't really like? Okay, just raise your hand. Okay, everybody else is lying. That's cool. Um, so uh, how many of you have somebody in your life that doesn't like you? Now everybody here. Everybody come to church now, okay? Everybody's like, oh, yeah, I know somebody. Um, that, like it's a surface level. Like it, it's just, you know, we just don't get along. We just kind of uh, avoid each other. Um, then there's another level of our otherhood where it's not just people we don't gel well with. It's somebody that's, they're a part of another tribe. And when I say another tribe, sometimes it's even uh, another denomination. Like I, it, nothing bothers me more than hearing a pastor bash another pastor at, at, at another denomination. Especially when people start to talk about my guy, Joel Osteen. I'm like, hey, man, you better back up off Joel. You know how many people he didn't got into the kingdom? Okay, he didn't got more people in the kingdom on a Sunday than you didn't got in your whole life. <laughs> but it, it, like sometimes it's going, man, they're, they're in a different tribe religiously, theologically, philosophically. Sometimes it even goes deep when we run into somebody that voted differently than us. The election's coming. Be careful who you hang out with because you never know what might pop off at a coffee. Uh, there, there is, and then all of a sudden it's going, wait, we don't believe the same things about sexuality, abortion, and, and racism. We're, you're in my otherhood. You're on the other side of what I believe about life, and all of a sudden there is there is something different. We have different beliefs about the haves and the have-nots, about first class and and coach like there's there's some separation between us and it's like okay I can only really rock with those who believe what I believe and really see the world the way that I see the world because you're in my otherhood and then uh, it gets even deeper um, th these are people that we compare ourselves to uh, most most comparisons happen on the internet it's people we follow and, and sometimes uh, I don't know about you, have you ever seen someone falling from grace and there was just a little bit of you that enjoyed their fall? And why? Because it was somebody that you saw high on the scale of life and it was like the, the, the playing field was being leveled. Have you ever heard of, of someone that was famous, Christian or not, that experienced some sort of infidelity or they cheated on their spouse and a part of you was like, there's something in us that sometimes wants to see the scales kind of tipped in our favor because it makes a person that seems impervious to life's problems, it makes them seem normal like us. We're like, oh, okay, like they know what it's like to be brought down low. We like to see people, we love the term, come back down to earth as if there's these other group of people that live in the outer atmosphere, away from life's problems. Have you ever uh, had to pretend to be sad for somebody you don't like? Like, you, like, like something bad happened to them, you're like, that's just so too bad. I can't believe that happened to you. Especially when it's your ex-girlfriend, your ex-boyfriend. Somebody broke their heart. You're like, oh, that happened? That's so, I'm, I'm so sad. To hear that happen in your life, you know, you, you, 
you know, that's, that's, that's what, you had something great, but you, you, you know, you chose, you made decisions, that's life. And there's something in you that's just going, mm, this is, and it's hard to see this in the mirror. It's hard to talk about this out loud for us to actually confess, yes, I enjoyed somebody else's demise. Who says that out loud? But it's in us. To something, it's like there's a enemy in the inside of me. It's weird. Now, the, the deepest level, the people that make it into our otherhood, um, are the people that hurt us. They got there on purpose. This is not a personality mix. This is not just oh, who you voted for. This, this is this is not just oh, I follow you on Instagram. And I don't really like your life. No, 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 no. They did something. They said something. They abused you. They left you. They broke your heart. They talked about you behind your back. Have you ever had to hang out with a friend that talked about you behind your back, but they don't know that you know that they talked about you behind your back? Hey, girl. You're like, oh, it's hey, girl now, huh? Oh, okay. We cool? Oh, we cool now. Okay. That's cool. I'm a great boss now, convenient now, okay, on payday, I'm a great boss, I see. But there's, it's, it, it's difficult when somebody that has hurt us, you know what breaks my heart is, is when I sit across the table from people that haven't talked to siblings or parents for a decade. And I'm just, my heart breaks for them. What's going to happen? They do, what did, what did they say? The saddest story is when they tell me this, I don't remember. I just remember it hurt. I don't remember what it was. I don't remember what, what it said or, or what they did. It's just separation got between you and a person that you love. And somehow, maybe today might be the first time that you could even say out loud that they became the enemy. They became this person that is in opposition to you. Regardless of how they became your enemy, the good news for you today is this, is that they don't have to remain your enemy. It's like God's got this plan for all of our lives. He's going, listen, uh, you know this person in your life, this group of people in your life, like you've got this label on them. Can you imagine a world where we could give them a different title? What if, what if we could do something about that? Because you know what I've found when I sit with people, the thing that they really want the most, an apology. They, they want somebody to go, I'm sorry that happened to you. They want, they want the, the, the person that hurt them the most to come back and apologize and say, you were right. Unfortunately, most of the people I sit with have been waiting a long time for that. What would you do if I told you that you could move on without an apology? What would you do if I told you that uh, you wouldn't have to get the score even for you to move on with your life? Because sometimes people hurt us so deeply that we stay hurt. And the worst version of us is the hurt version of us. We start taking it out on other people that weren't even there. We're like, why are you so mad? I didn't even, I didn't do nothing to you. They mad at somebody else. They're just not in the room. They're still responding to what happened in middle school. And they're in their 40s yelling at people at work. <laughs> like, dude, what's wrong with you? I just got here. It's Monday. <laughs> we have to deal with the enemy on the inside of us. And God's got a plan. Our usual plan <laughs> for dealing with our enemies. Retaliation. Eye for an eye, I'm going to fix this. Oh, no, I got this. How's that plan work out for us historically? Uh, our second plan is uh, gossip. I'm going to just talk about them. How many of us have just talked about them for a long time? And guess what? They stay the enemy. It, cr it keeps the narrative going that I was done wrong and, and I'm right and they're 
wrong. And so it just, it keeps it going. And gossip is very difficult to see in the mirror because nobody intends to gossip. Nobody says, hey, man, you want to come over to the house? Let's gossip about some people. Like, that doesn't happen, okay? Hey, we're going to have some tea, we're going to have some wine, some pizza, we're going to watch the game, we're going to gossip about everybody we know. Good. Like, that doesn't happen. But it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, when we're gossiping about somebody, it sometimes it feels like we're getting something off of our chest and putting it on somebody else. It's like we got it off our chest, but it kind of stays in our stomach, makes us sick. And in hindsight, we go, man, I, I feel bad. I don't know if this ever happened to you. Have you ever gossiped about somebody and then that person was kind to you later? And you're like, I just said that. I ain't even mean it. You didn't even know it. Never mind. I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the, it, gossip for us is something that happens in our soul that is a part of our scoreboard. It's the scoring system. It's proverbial. It, it's this thing that says, uh, if I can talk about them, w- what it'll do is it'll knock them down a few notches, at least in my mind. They're not even there, Okay. But at least in your mind and at least in your friend's mind, I want you to know that this person isn't as great as you think they are. In fact, did you hear? And then we start using statements like, but I would never. No points for them. A couple points for me. And it's almost like we're trying to score points with one another, take some from some other people, give some to ourselves because that's what gossip gives to us. Y'all, I went on a gossip break. I did a gossip fast, y'all. I did it for two weeks. I said, you know what? I'm not saying nothing negative about nobody because uh, gossip is contagious. Sometimes people just draw you into, hey, man, what you think? Oh, man. And then next thing you know, you're like, I don't even, I, I like that person. What are we doing? So I said, for two weeks, okay, I'm doing a gossip fast. We're just going to see what happens. Listen, I'm not talking negative about nobody. Listen, y'all, there were was, was about two, three friends I lost completely, okay? I couldn't even talk to them because all they got to do is say number negative stuff about other people. They're like, could they call me. Hey, man, I'm on a two-week break right now, man. I'll, I'll talk to you in a couple weeks. <laughs> now, I can say something negative in somebody's face, but not behind their back, okay? That's the point. It's this scoring system that... If we're all honest, nobody wins the game. Everybody live, leaves a little bit more broken, a little bit more hurt, and all of us just have a, a bunch of more regrets. You ever gossiped about somebody and felt good later? Like, man, that was pretty good. I'm glad we did that. Like, that never happened. <laughs> but we can kind of kind of get trapped into it, and we can. it starts off as, man, I was just confiding in a friend. And all of a sudden, it starts turning into, I I need to get some more points and knock them down a few. We desperately need a better plan for what to do with these people that sometimes we call them. And there's nobody better to have a plan for us to deal with this than Jesus Christ. He got way more thems than you do. He got way more people in his other hood than you do. Like, Jesus was born with enemies. Not, not adult Jesus. Baby Jesus had enemies. He was a fugitive born, okay? <laughs> he is on the run. He just got here. Like, what did I do? He didn't do nothing to nobody. A baby. <laughs> born with regulations of going. And in the Jewish culture, you have to understand, it was all about unclean and clean. Who's in? Who's out? Everything was labeled. Jesus, here are the people we talk to. Here are the people we eat with. Literally, the Bible goes out of its way to tell us Jesus was eating with sinners and tax collectors. Because anybody reading that in first century Christianity would have said, he was doing what? He's not supposed to be eating with tax collectors. And he's definitely not supposed to be calling them to get out of trees and throw parties at their house. This rabbi is different. He, he's not supposed to be talking to a Samaritan woman at a well. And even in that very conversation, the label started. Okay, well, you Jews, you worship on this mountain, and we do this. And he's going, what, what are you doing? We, we, these, these labels, that I, I, don't, I don't live by this code in which you, I can touch lepers, even though I'm not supposed to. I, I, I can speak to him, although I'm not 
supposed to. Sometimes I wear long clothes. One time I healed a lady. I didn't even know what I was doing. I was just walking, and she touched me. I said, who did this? And then the next thing you know, she was here. I know I wasn't supposed to, but I just don't have the same rules that, that you have. Uh, one time in, in Mark 9, this is funny, uh, <laughs> the teacher said, John, hey, uh, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Hey, uh, listen, I know that this other dude, he was driving out darkness in your name, but he don't wear our jersey, so... He, well, no, we, we stopped him. We said, hey, stop driving away darkness, okay? Only we do that, okay? We're the Ghostbusters, you're the no-busters, okay? Do you understand? <laughs> do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. It's as if Jesus is consistently in his life turning every them into an us. He's even doing it when he's dying on the cross. Jesus, like, we, we would have been cool. You could have done it is finished without helping that last thief. Okay, like, like we would have been like, this man is awesome. You still could have conquered the grave. But even on his last breath, he's going, is there somebody that is in opposition that I can reach one last time? Is it a Roman soldier's ear that I can heal one last Last time, everything in him is trying to cross the tracks to the other side, to his other hood. He's going, I don't have these rules and regulations. I, I just want to, I think love can break our division. I think love can break our segregation. I think love can do things that our gossip never could. Um, in fact, even before he tells us to love our enemies, he gives us this mantra that you might be familiar with, even if you're not a church person. He says in Matthew 5, 41, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. The, the old adage, go the extra mile. Uh, this was uh, called Pax Romana. And Pax Romana was uh, the way that Romans ruled uh, cities whenever they invaded a country. They would set up a military post to show their rule and reign. And uh, they could do anything. Pax Romana means uh, the peace of Rome. They could do just about anything legally under the guise of, we're doing this under the peace of Rome. You ever seen in a movie where uh, a uh, CIA agent does something bogus under the, the guise of national security that's probably illegal, but it's like, hey, it's under national security, we can't talk about it. Th this is what Pax Romana was. It was, going, hey, this is for the peace of Rome, this is what we're doing, and by law, a Roman soldier could go up to a Jewish boy and say, hey, I need you to carry my stuff for a mile, and legally, that boy would have to drop whatever he was doing, carry his stuff one mile. This was a walk of shame. It was just a reminder that the Romans were definitely in charge, and we are ruling over you. They would be mocked for this entire mile. Then they'd have to have that same walk of shame back. Friends waiting for them, like, hey, man, where you been? Man, you know, I had to carry this Roman stuff. Jesus is going, hey, I got a plan for that Roman soldier. Go two miles. Because I guarantee you this, there has never been a Roman soldier in history that ever tried to rule and reign over somebody. And they responded with, can I do it for two miles? Can you imagine the Roman soldier going, you want to do what? You want to carry it too? I asked you to do one. The law only requires you to do one. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But I like you. So let me, uh, let me show you some love. Man I, I, I got, man, I got two legs, two miles. It makes sense. Let's do it. <laughs> Jesus' plans, like, his listeners would have been like, you want us a two mile? Two miles in shame? He's going, no, 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 no. Two miles in shame. Two miles in love. Because that's what I do. I can flip this thing around. His plan for the person in our otherhood, however they got there, this is how they won't stay that way. <laughs> it's simple. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. What do I want you to do with the person or the group of people? that have been in opposition to you, I want you to add them to your prayer list. 
And I don't, and, and again, let's just be honest for a second. I'm, I'm gonna keep it with you. I'm gonna keep it 100 with you. Okay, I barely pray for people I like, let alone people I don't like. So, <laughs> but yeah, add them to your prayer list, and that might be difficult for you. But remember, we have all been added to a list that we didn't belong on. We were all given grace when we did not deserve it. So yeah, we can add people to our prayer list. And uh, what I want you to do when you pray for uh, an enemy or pray for somebody that has, that has hurt you, um, I want you to, to pray honest. I want you to even uh, what I would call petty prayers. Uh, petty prayers is when you pray like David. You ever read how David prayed for his enemies? He said, break their jaws, oh Lord. Like David kept it at 100 all the way. He going to tell God how, how he really feels. Like, like you're not going to trick God talking about some God, I beseech you for my But like, He ain't going to beseech God. He know exactly how you feel about this person. So tell him. So pray petty. Pray for your ex. Lord, I pray that you help move out of his mama house, get a full-time job, help him get some new clothes, help him, Jesus. Pray for the girl you work with. Pray for little Keisha. Got an attitude, Lord. I pray you fix her attitude. Touch her nappy head, crusty toes. <laughs> fix her life, Lord. Help her come to work with some with some good breath. Help her get some Altoids. <laughs> I mean, just pray how you feel. Get it off your chest. You're not gonna trick God. He knows. <laughs> what are you trying to lie to God? Like he's gonna be surprised. <laughs> That's day one. Day two is special because day two. Um, here is the beauty of prayer. Um, you're going to be talking to God about this person that you're in opposition to that's in your other hood. Um, and here's the cool part. God's going to start talking back about this person you don't like and they don't like you. And that is the most beautiful thing that can happen to anybody in your other hood. Because there's this person that you work with, they may not even know God, and they, you guys just keep having beef. There's this tension. It's, it's nonstop. And I promise you, one day, y'all going to have this, this heated moment. You're going to go, I've been praying for you. They're going to be like, what's wrong? You've been praying for me. Yeah, I want you to know, man, God's got a plan for your life. And all of a sudden, your prayers start changing. You start praying for them completely different. You start going, instead of, instead, of, instead of praying for their attitude, you start going, Lord, is there anything that happened in their life that made them this way? God, would you heal the parts of them that hurt the most? Because I think that they need you. In fact, maybe the reason they hurt me has nothing to do with me at all. Maybe something deeper was going on with them, and so God... Would you use me to bring them closer to you? Somebody you are praying for consistently is very difficult to stay an enemy. They've just made your prayer list. Uh, a couple months ago, I got an opportunity to go uh, speak in a prison. Uh, there is a program called God Behind Bars that partners with churches to take sermons um, into uh, prison systems, and it, it, it literally becomes a campus. Uh, the church I grew up at, um, I get to speak at a few times a year. Um, they have this program, and they actually consider it one of their campuses at a prison. So they uh, have been taking uh, little sermons of mine into the prison system and playing them for a couple years now. So um, I got requested to come there live, and they gave me a bunch of rules uh, for how to conduct myself inside the prison walls, which I have no issue with whatsoever. They gave me a two-page uh, two Word document. One of them said, don't bring in your smart watch, otherwise you'll do one year in prison. I said, you can have a watch. I can get another watch outside. It's easy. Um, they said, whatever you do, don't hug any of the inmates. Otherwise, you also could do one year in prison. I said, you ain't got to tell me that. I'm good. Like, I understand the, these rules. Like, we, we're good. Um, so they knew me, but I didn't know them. So uh, they were like, hey, do you want to greet the inmates when, when, you, when they come in? I said, yeah, that ain't no problem. So to avoid, because you know, like, there's, there's a handshake. Like, what's up, man? You good? Oh, cool. You know, you can do all the handshakes like that. But then there's, hey, man, you good? And then there's the, you know, the pull-in. When, it, when it's a guy, you like, oh, this dude cool. You know, there, there's the pulling. So 
I was bracing for the pull-in, so I, I got in kind of an athletic stand and shook everybody's hands like this. I was like, what's that, man? It's good. It's like, oh, Ryan, thank you so much, man. Your message is so encouraging. Oh, man, that's great. That's great, man. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. Because I ain't going to jail for nobody in here, okay? So, like, hey, it's good. It's good to see you, man. God bless you, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. All of a sudden, uh, a dude came in. He was a little bit bigger than me, right? And he was a lot stronger than me. So when he went to pull in, I didn't really have much choice in the matter. So he pulled me in, and I was like, I'm about to go to jail. Oh, my God. <laughs> he pulled me in real tight, close. He was like, hey, listen to me. I said, yeah? He said, hey, this better be good. I said, what you say? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I don't really get nervous before I speak, but that Tuesday night, I was super nervous. He said, better be good, man. What do you mean, better be good? He goes, do you want to know what's going to happen to you if tonight's not fire? I said, what you say? What's going to happen to me if tonight's not fire? That's kind of kind of pressure, okay? Ain't nobody ever said nothing like that to me. He said, we're going to keep you here. I said, guard. Y'all hear what he said? You didn't hear it? Y'all, I preach like my life depended on it, okay? <laughs> Genesis, the Torah, Pentateuch, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Moses, Josiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, visions, prophets. I talked about the maps in the back. I said, y'all see what a Red Sea the Red Sea, he went right here. I'm getting out of here, okay? I'm preaching my way out of these gates. Y'all not keeping me, okay? I'm going to preach everything I got, every message. Uh, truth be told, um, they had heard me speak before, and um, I really just wanted to hang out. I'm like, I, I didn't want to just come talk. I really wanted to, to really visit with the prisoner. So I give them a little bit of normal. Like, man, I just, I just want to hang out, man. What's been going on? Like, I really just wanted to, to talk, so... I'm at the end. I said, hey, I'm only going to talk for like 20 minutes. And, and then at the end, let's just do some Q&A. I just want to talk and just have, have some conversation. First question. Um, I talked about Moses that night. And first question, guy, front row, arms crossed, no Bible in his hand. He said, hey, uh, you talked about Moses tonight. I said, that's right. He said, Jude 9 says that Satan and the, the archangel Michael had an argument about Moses' body. What do you think about that? Jude 9? I haven't read Jude 9 in a minute. My goodness, let me flip to Jude 9. You said Jude 9, sir? Okay. Jude 9, Satan and the archangel. Okay. Now that's that's it. like I'm like this guy has read the whole Bible like today like I didn't never come across Jude nine I said this guy's this is a philosopher are you a professor sir and then this guy asked a question that was so real he said hey man uh, if I'm honest certain things about me never gonna change I said like what man he said if somebody tries to fight me and they want this smoke they are gonna get this smoke do you understand me I said man I I get it and. It's like, man, we, we all got enemies in here. Like, what do you really expect us to do? Not fight? He said, man, I can't ask you to do that. What I can't ask you to do is what Jesus asked us all to do. Pray for me. Go back to your cell and write out an enemies list and pray for them. One Next time one of them tries to pick a fight with you, when they push you, I want you to scream. I've been praying for you. And just see what happens. And then fight. As long as you pray before the fight, we're good. <laughs> Baby steps, okay? Baby steps. We all on a journey. If I could ask them to do it, how can we? Praying for the person that hurt you the most is the fastest way to get poison out of your soul. I am not saying that you need to reconcile with them. I am saying you need to forgive them. There might still need to be some proximity between you and them. I'm not saying you need to even be friends again. Because some relationships are just toxic no matter what. But I am saying we can no longer allow enemies to stay inside of me. They have way too much power, way too much control. 
It affects all of the other relationships that God wants us to have. Pray for them. Bless them. Love them. Wish them well. Because praying for our the people that have hurt us the most, ironically, I believe does more for us than it does for them. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to give each and every person an opportunity to surrender their life to Christ. You may be here today, you go, you know what? I got a lot of hurts and a lot of pains. I want you to know there is a Savior. His name is Jesus. He wants to carry your burdens. You might be here today and you say, man, I may have walked away from church, walked away from God for a while, and today you want to come back home. If that's you today, whether it's your first time, second time, just know that right now is the perfect time. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand and say, hey, Ryan, that's me. Ryan, that's me. Is there anybody with us today? I see your hand. That's awesome. Anybody else? I see your hand back there. That's awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else? Hey, can we all say this prayer together? Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. I ask now that you will be the Lord and Savior of my life. I surrender my life, my future, and my decisions to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say it. Amen. Come on, can we make some noise for each and every person that gave their heart to Christ?